Um, you mentioned uh, models in your last answer, and uh, people have asked whether we can really rely on those models to tell us about um, the future of our climate. It's a very good question, but of course we have to remember that they are the only thing we have to tell us about the future. We're trying to look into the future to predict what's going to happen based on the best science and our best understanding of how the climate system works. And the only way to do that is through using these models. And I think what people find difficult to understand is what actually is this thing that we call a model? Well, it's a huge computer code and it's about solving the very fundamental equations of physics that describe the motion of the atmosphere, the motion of the oceans, how clouds form, how the land interacts with uh, the sun's rays, how it, how it interacts with rainfall and so on and so on and so on. So what these models are is they are hundreds and thousands of lines of code which capture, represent our best understanding of how the climate system works. So they're not in a sense um, tuned to give the right answer. What they're actually representing is how weather, winds blow, how rain forms and so forth, absolutely freely based on the fundamental laws of physics. So how do we know that they're, they're good? Well, we continually test them against observations of the current climate in lots and lots of ways. At the Met Office, we use the same model to make weather forecasts as we do to make our climate predictions. So every day we're testing the model and saying, how well did we do with the weather forecast? And we know that in many occasions, our weather forecasts are incredibly skillful. And that's increasingly giving us confidence that the, that the science that's in our models is fit to do the, this, this crystal ball gazing into the future to say what will happen to our climate as we go really into uncharted territory. Because we're taking this planet somewhere it has never been before. Uh, at least for, for millions of years, with CO2 levels at the level they are at now and will be in the, next de in the coming decades, whatever we do, into temperature regimes that civilization has not seen. So we have to trust these models and to understand the scientific basis behind them and, and accept that you know, they are our best way forward for looking at what the future could look like for this planet in terms of our climate. People have drawn attention to the fact that um, there's been talk of global cooling over the last decade or a stabilisation in temperatures and also a recovery of Arctic sea ice in the last couple of years. Um, is this proof that global warming has stopped? It's back to this question of what's natural variability and what's anthropogenic human-induced climate change. And we know the climate varies naturally. As I've already said, we have El Nino, we have other changes that we understand very well. Mostly these things driven by circulations in the ocean which operate on much longer time scales than the weather in the atmosphere. So if we look at the global mean temperature record over the last decade or so, 1998 we had the warmest year on record. And the reason for that was because it was an El Nino year and we know that El Nino, which is a periodic warming of the tropical Pacific Ocean and has global impacts leads to an elevation of the global mean temperature. And we understand that very well. And since the turn of the millennium, we've had a, a number of years with fairly stable global temperatures. And that's partly because we've been also into a colder phase in the Pacific. We will be publishing very shortly now to uh, our latest results for 2009 and they will show that if we take the whole decade from the year 2000 to 2009 this will be the warmest decade on record. So what we need to be careful is not to just take the temperatures from a few years and say oh global warming's gone away. It doesn't work like that because they are on a year by year basis they're, they're affected by natural variability but we need to take this these longer term averages and then you'll see that the warming trend is irrefutable 
um, and the last three decades have progressively been warmer than the previous one and this last decade that we have now just got the results for show that it's it's way outside the warmth of any previous decades that we have since instrumental records began. And is that the same for Arctic sea ice? So the Arctic sea ice, again, a very interesting question, that in 2007 we had suddenly this dramatic uh, decline in summer sea ice cover in the Arctic. And we were looking at this very closely, it was very interesting, because everybody said, oh, this is a sign of global warming. And what was actually going on was that we had a circulation, a change in the winds over the Arctic, which altered the movement of the summer sea ice. In fact, it pushed a lot of it to one side of the base and exposed a lot of open water. And what's been happening over the last couple of years since 2007 is that those circulation, those wind changes have not been so acute and the summer sea ice has started to recover a little bit. But if you look at this more carefully, that variation that we saw in 2007 and the, the recovery since then is on top of a gradual decline in Arctic sea ice, summer sea ice cover as, as the planet warms up. And so we expect to see these year-to-year -year variations, but they don't mean that global warming has gone away or doesn't exist. They're just part of that natural variability of the climate system, which will be imprinted on top of the global warming trend. Another question is that, is global warming uh, necessarily all bad? Aren't there some advantages? If you're just thinking about yourself personally, and say you were living in the north of England or somewhere and might suddenly be able to grow grapes and olives, you might think, well, this is not so bad. But I think for the planet as a whole, we have to be quite clear that this is very bad news. As I said, what's happening is happening very rapidly. And what we'll find is that all sorts of aspects of of not just our lives, but all life on the planet will be affected in ways that will be very difficult to adjust to. So we see uh, real dangers for loss of major ecosystems, loss of biodiversity. For some uh, communities, complete loss of livelihoods. Or even if we think about some of the island states who are facing sea level rise, completely, complete loss of where they live. So I think you have to, we have to look at this in the global context. We all live together on this planet and for all of us we will be affected one way or another um, by the adverse effects of global warming on food security, water security, migration of populations uh, who can no longer live where they currently live, uh, coastal cities in danger from rising sea levels, from more extreme weather, Wherever we look, um, the impacts are profound and damaging. There has been a lot of talk about um, climate change potentially impacting the Gulf Stream, which is obviously the, the current which brings warm water um, across the Atlantic. Potentially melting the ice cap and changes in temperature could affect that, slow it down or even stop it. Is that the case? And if so, what would the impact be? That's quite right. We do think that uh, th this thing called the Gulf Stream, which is um, driven by changes in the heat and saltiness of the water that's formed in these, these northern oceans um, could be changed by climate change. And in fact, we've un undertaken a lot of research over the last few years, uh, working also with our colleagues in academia. And we've also, with the Americans, put in a, a monitoring array so we can actually see, observe what's happening to the Gulf Stream. And the result of all that research and those observations is that we don't think that the Gulf Stream uh, will change that much, and at least in the coming century, as we go into global warming. M most of the evidence suggests there might be a slight slowdown of the Gulf Stream, but no evidence at all now that it would collapse. And even if it did collapse, and we can do these what-if experiments in our climate models, um, yes, there would be a real cooling influence on the UK and Western Europe because we, we, we do enjoy the effects of the Gulf Stream and the fact that we have much milder winters and so forth. We don't think that even that would be enough to counteract the effects of global warming. 